Uh, so, yeah, I have the absolutely unenviable task of following up to uh, incredible uh, presentations. So, uh, sorry if I take the tone down a little bit. And uh, I'm, I worry that Anna just caught me on a really good day uh, the last time when she saw me spoke. But uh, here we go. So, uh, yeah, I'm a writer, um, mostly to you know, nonfiction. And I think that's uh, a bit of a catch because I get to find interesting things that other people do. I don't make anything myself. I find interesting things that other people do, uh, and then I write about them. And for some reason, people allocate me a bit of credit for that, which is uh, uh, a bit of a lie, I see. But to those who did see my Sonic Axe uh, presentation, I forgive, you know, forgive me because we're going to run through this story. I promised Honor we would talk about this guy because he is so fantastic. Uh, this is a man named uh, Cyrus Reed Teed. And he was an experimenter. He liked playing around with electricity. He lived about 100 years ago, 1850s, something like that. And one day, he was messing around with electricity, and he got a massive shock, and he knocked him out flat. He was unconscious. And during his, uh, his brief spell of unconsciousness, God came down to um, Teed and revealed the secrets of the universe. And one of the secrets that God revealed was that we don't live on the outside of a spherical Earth. We actually live on the inside, as if we were inside a giant shell. And when we looked up at the stars in the sky, uh, what we actually were doing was looking inwards at a, a giant mechanism of prisms and uh, batteries and all kinds of lights. And he had a, he had a very you know, clever uh, philosophy that explained all of this. So, so we started this, uh, this cult, essentially, a, a following called the Koreshonites. And they preached various things of virtue and good health and celibacy and all that. But they also preached that the world was inside out. and Everyone else was wrong, and they were right. And it was a very popular movement uh, during its time across the states and the rest of the world. And so the question is, if any of you here you know, had to prove that the world was, uh, was not, in fact, concave but convex, how would you do it? How would you prove that we live on the inside of a shell? And the answer of that is you build a really, really big ruler. Uh, and so that's what they set out to do. They, they established a base in, in Florida, and they, uh, it's a town called Estero. You can still go there and, and see the things that they built. And you can see part of this. This is their giant ruler. And the idea was these sections would fit together very, very precisely. And you would sort of go down the beach, and as soon as you got as far as you did with one lot of rectangulators, you would take the, the first one, and you would put it on the other end. So this whole thing would snake down the beach. And here's some of the uh, Koreshonites there. You know, standing with their giant ruler, hoping to see that as the ruler progressed along the beach, uh, because it was perfectly level, uh, it would seem that it would start digging down into the beach. They were expecting to see it drop. Uh, and if the world was, in fact, uh, concave, then it would get further and further away from the sand. And so that was the idea, but we'll come back to them in a minute. Uh, what I'm actually going to talk about between is this idea of hidden infrastructures and this idea of trying to things about the world that aren't necessarily immediately visible. Uh, so here's a, a few examples. Uh, some of you might recognize this if you're really, really dorky and into your sort of um, city blogs. Uh, this looks like a house in London, um, but it's in fact a ventilation tower with a tube. And they, they knocked down everything behind it, but they kept the front. And so these windows, you can see a slight difference in the, in the windows and the curtains in them. Uh, there's nothing behind it. There's no house. It's just a fake house. Uh, another example, this is an electricity substation in Canada. It was built in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, and they made it look like a bungalow, even so all it's inside is, is machines uh, to regulate the electricity for the neighborhood. Uh, this is a, uh, a telegraph, you know, a mobile phone mast kind of badly disguised as a tree. Uh, I think whoever drew that never actually saw a tree in real life, but this is their impression of what a tree looks like. And uh, here's a, a slightly better version, and I like this one. This is a, another uh, mobile phone mast uh, in the UK, and this is disguised as a windmill. There's two things that uh, really strike me about these pictures, and one is that there is a feeling that uh, a ventilation tower, a, an electricity substation, a mobile phone mast are not legitimate parts of the city. They, they need to be hidden. But why do we feel like that? Why do we feel that uh, you know, a ventilation tower is out of keeping with the neighborhood in London when it's, it's a, you know, an integral part of that neighborhood. Why would you want to hide that away? And this reaches a really zany conclusion with this windmill because a windmill is not natural, at least a tree. That was an attempt you know, to say, there were trees here before, let's make it look like a tree. But a windmill doesn't technically belong in a countryside. They don't grow 
you know, like trees do. Uh, this is a piece of sort of 17th, 18th century infrastructure. And when the windmills were first built, there were probably back, people back then said, God, they should make them look like trees. This is an eyesore. <laughs> Uh, and yet we seem to feel that this is okay, that this is uh, in keeping with the surroundings more so than uh, a mobile phone mast would be, uh, which makes me think maybe in the future when we have some kind of new technology, they'll be disguising things as mobile phone masts because that new technology won't, you know, it doesn't belong in a city or whatever it might be. But uh, this is some innocuous sort of versions. Oh, wait, I should talk about ley lines before that. This is another example of uh, hidden infrastructures Alfred Watkins in 1920, he was an amateur uh, archaeologist and, and such like, came up with this idea of ley lines, that there were the structures of ancient Britain, monuments, uh, megaliths, uh, greens, and that kind of stuff, were built according to straight lines. And so he, he sort of, we'd find about five of them in a row, and he'd say, okay, this is a ley line. And that idea, it, it got subsumed by sort of mysticism and, and this idea of energies and all this jazz. Uh, but his, his was quite a conservative idea, and he said that these things were built in straight lines so that when you were walking around a heavily forested Britain, you would be able to see where you needed to go to because there weren't any roads. And so you had to be able to see each point along the way, and so for that reason, they were built in straight lines, and then you could, uh, you could navigate by them. And uh, you know, no one really believes that uh, Alfred Watkins was right on that. It's a nice idea, but there's no real strong evidence to support it. But there are ley lines. There are ley lines that do govern how cities are formed. And these are some ley lines that sit over London. And they are exactly, almost exactly, what Watkins said they were. These are lines of sight, and they're protected views within London. You're not allowed to build anything within that corridor. It's a three-dimensional space that sits sort of on the city and above the city. You're not allowed to build anything in there that would disrupt that line of view. And so, uh, you know, a better idea here. You can see this is one of the protected views. Uh, a lot of them are of St. Paul's. Um, and not only are you not allowed to build anything that would uh, sit in front of St. Paul's, in front of the cathedral, you're also not allowed to build anything behind it that would ruin uh, the horizon of it cresting you know, magnificently uh, coming out of the city. And uh, here's an example of one of the protected views is from King's Mound in uh, <coughs> Richmond Park, uh, looking down at the cathedral. This was incepted only a few years after the cathedral itself was completed. Uh, so it's 300 years old, it's about 10 miles long, and it has restricted certain building within the city because uh, I think Liverpool Street was not able to be developed as much as it, the developers wanted to because it would have ruined this line of sight. And so there are sort of these uh, invisible sight lines within cities that shape the way that they are built. Uh, here's a guy who's, who's uh, you know, less innocuous use of infrastructure. This is Robert Moses. Robert Moses was the, famously the man who, who helped to build New York City into what it is today. Uh, but he was a social engineer as much as a civil engineer. And his, the, the, the creations that he had had very strong sort of sociological uh, underlying factors. Here's an example. These are the bridges over Long Island um, when he built his interstates there. He was very, very careful to make sure there were these very lovely stone you know, bucolic uh, bridges, low bridges built over all of the main highways that went across Long Island. And the reason for that isn't because he was sort of modeling it on England and they sort of, you know, thought our, our country was lovely. It's because these bridges are too low for, ba for buses to get underneath. And uh, in, back in that day, the people who rode buses were primarily poor people and poor people primarily black people as well. And so this was his way of preventing poor people from reaching the beaches favored by rich white people. Uh, and there was, he intentionally didn't build public transit to go out to those beaches either. So it was a way of you know, modeling who could go where. Uh, and of course, everyone today has cars, so it's a, a moot point. Here's another example. I took this picture. This is not far from where I used to live in London. Um, this is a, a chair that's in a park. And it's fascinating. I'm absolutely obsessed with this chair because someone along the way decided that the best way to build a park would be to put a chair for one person in there. <laughs> Uh, and there's a reason for this. You know, it's, uh, it's in North London. Uh, there's big immigrant populations. They tend not to go to the same social meeting points uh, that you know, other people do. And so they don't tend to go to pubs, maybe. Um, maybe they don't go to whatever it might be, these institutions. And they gather. They gather in public spaces. And you know, for some reason, people don't like this. They don't like the idea of people gathering together. Uh, and so they made the bench really, really short to make sure that you couldn't fit a group of people on it. Uh, and that way you wouldn't get people just sort of sitting around drinking beers and uh, generally, I don't know, using a park for exactly what a park should be used for. 
Uh, and so it's, this park is a skewermorph. It's, it's designed to look like a park, but it functionally isn't actually a park. It's just there to so people can sort of say that they've got a park. Uh, it's, you know, this is an example of hardened architecture, architecture that's against certain groups of people. Uh, here's another example. This, you know, what could, what, who could argue with this? There's a lovely park with some kids in it. Um, but this is actually a political weapon, and that's because in the States, there are lots and lots of uh, places which have laws that say registered sex offenders are not allowed to live within a certain distance of a school or a park. And so, as a consequence, count, uh, communities build parks specifically to drive sex offenders out of their community, which is a, you know, a very strange approach to it. And um, these parks aren't necessarily any good. Uh, this one behind it, maybe they're going to make that one better eventually, I don't know. Uh, but some of them are so small, they are just notional parks. They only exist there as a way of keeping out people that the community doesn't want in there. And as a result, this is a place called Miracle Village in, uh, in Florida. And you can see, these all, I think 90% of the residents of that village are registered sex offenders because it's the one place locally that they can actually legally live in, uh, because it's far away from everywhere else. Uh, I don't know what would happen if someone moved there with kids, whether they would all have to move out. You'd probably be a bit crazy if you wanted to move somewhere that 90% sexual offenders uh, you know, is your community. But nonetheless, it's an interesting consequence of these laws. Uh, this is Steve Duncan. Steve Duncan is, uh, you may recognize him, he does a TV thing called Urban Explorers on Discovery. Uh, he roots around in lots of sewers and on top of buildings all over the world. A fantastic guy, very, very intelligent. And this is what he said when I interviewed him about why he goes and digs around in, in tunnels and, and, uh, and sewers. He said it's not just that the city targets poor people in these infrastructures but the individual interests struggle and vie with one another. It's better to see infrastructure as a conflict playing out between groups within the city. And so he said it was absolutely essential that you could see infrastructure because it didn't serve everyone equally. And only when you could see it, you know, it wasn't hidden behind buildings, if it wasn't hidden under the ground, would you then be, would you know that it was serving everyone equally and people weren't being excluded, uh, like Robert Moses Bridges, for example. Uh, so, talking about a bit of oh, maps here, let me just check my time so I know how I'm doing. Okay. Um, Untruthful maps, and so this idea of maps, how you display these, uh, these infrastructures, I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit. In the 19, oh goodness, 10s all the way through to the end, the fall of the USSR, it was well known that Russian maps were deliberately falsified. And so here's an example, I want you to follow this town, Logoshkino. Uh, this is a map from 1939. Here is the town in 1954, it's moved. Uh, in 1962, it suddenly becomes a coastal town. Uh, 1967, it's back in land again, and uh, you know, in the final one, it's moved across the parallel. It's moved across, so this town moves around. And you were also not allowed to show maps uh, without certain resolutions, so you could only get very distant, small, you know, resolution maps. And we still do this as much as we might think it's funny that the Russians did that. Uh, you can go on Google Maps, and you can find things that don't match up with reality. And this idea that the map is is a, a fiction. It's an abstract of what's actually there. This is a Reims Air Force Base in France, bit of a you know, token effort, really, to hide it. Uh, another one, this is a, an atomic uh, research facility in France. Again, a much better uh, attempt at hiding it. Uh, this is beautiful. This is in, uh, in the Netherlands, and very, another airfield, and they've obscured it from the map. And we all know it's there. I mean, you plug it into Google and you can find it. Um, so who are they really hiding things from when they do this? You can bet that any country that would have a, an ability to attack an airfield uh, would have their own pictures. They don't use Google Maps uh, to plan their airstrikes. So who, who are they hiding that from? It's, in, it's interesting to me. Maps is fictions. You can take this a step further, and you can actually go into, uh, tell a whole story. So this is a Russian map produced around 1903, and the narrative here is that everyone who lives in this is very wide-ranging, you know, spread of peoples and cultures, but they're all Russian. They're all together, you know, solid like that. Another one, this is a missionary's map of Africa. Look how closely these, these lines that Europeans drew in Africa nevertheless became states. These are drawn without any regard to the cultures and you know, the, the peoples who were there, and yet people who fell either side of those boundaries ended up having different national identities today, you know, less than 100 years later, purely because of the line that someone else drew. Uh, this is a Christian map dividing the world into... Uh, Christendom, and actually going so far as to make it iconographic. It's, uh, they're called a T and O map, and the top is Asia. It's actually oriented, so east is upwards, 
And so you have Asia, Europe, and Africa and divided into three worlds. And the same thing happening again there. The religious aspect of it has overpowered the actual geography. And so you realign the map to, along religious lines. And uh, I should say that in Islam, they do this as well. So you've got this word Christendom, the kingdom of Christ, as all of the Christian countries in the world. And uh, you have the same thing in, in uh, Islam. So you have Dar al-Islam, which is all of the Islamic world. And you have, uh, let me get this right, uh, Dar al-Hab, which is the land of strife, which is anywhere where Muslims aren't free to, you know, to, uh, to practice. And there are various other houses. These are Dar meaning house. So there's a house of uh, peace, a house of um, invitation, where you're, you know, you've been invited to go. There's a house of truce, where Islam and Christianity were at war, and they're not now. And so they're dividing the world along uh, this religious uh, aspect, geography as, as a form of religion. This is wonderful. In uh, Judaism as well, you have in, in, in uh, certain aspects of Judaism, these laws you must follow if you're very, very strict about carrying objects between different places. And so you, on the Sabbath, you're, allow, you're not allowed to carry things from a private to a public area. This is law of transference. And also, you can't carry it from a mixed area to a public or a private. And everywhere is divided up into those four. And to get around this, what they create is they, they join up a huge area and say that is now a private residence. It is essentially a single entity. These are called an Eruv, which is someone described, wonderfully described as a Jew, Jewish microstate. And now you're finally allowed, because when I say you're not allowed to carry things, I'm not talking about your mobile phone. It can include your children um, or your medication. And so not being able to leave the house with, you know, with your medication is quite a, quite a problem. So they make this entire area a private area, you know, a house of, of Judaism, as it were. And so now you can go about and do your shopping on, a, on the Sabbath if you want to. Here's another one. This is in Chicago. Uh, I don't know whether they intended to make it look like a person, but it, yeah, it's pretty cool. I like that. And we do. Uh, maps as narratives, you most likely may have seen this. Uh, Adam Curtis wrote about this, is where I filched it from recently. And this was an invasion map uh, that was drawn up as a work of fiction, but was so compelling when it was published by the Daily Mail that uh, people were crying out that there were spies everywhere, and it ended up led to the creation of MI5. Uh, and wonderfully, the editors demanded that the man who wrote this a fictitious invasion map rerouted the invasion to go through areas that were mostly Daily Mail readers. Uh, so it would be relevant to them. It's true. Uh, and yet it works, you know. And we, this, the invasion maps are very, very popular. We use them all the time. So this is one from 1940, imagining uh, what might happen if, uh, you know, the war in Europe spilled out into America. They would need more bombers. After America entered the war, uh, when we had more of these. So this appeared in uh, Life magazine, 1942. And this is more, there was never any suggestion, there was never found any maps within uh, you know, Nazi memorabilia and Nazi records that implied that they were planning to invade uh, America or the rest of the world. And yet, we wanted to create that fiction to help solidify that war against them. Uh, more maps there. And we keep doing this. This is from a Russian one, which is, you know, is about us, about our plans to attack Syria, although that got voted down, so maybe just the US. Uh, and of course, this famous, uh, famous piece of uh, fiction, this 45 minutes of Saddam having uh, biological and chemical weapons he could launch, and we had the maps to go with it. And wonderfully, remember the dodgy dossier, the famous dodgy dossier that supported these claims? Its actual name, its real name, is Iraq, its infrastructure of concealment, deception, and intimidation. So perhaps the worst infrastructure fiction of all time. Uh, another example, this is the Montevideo Metro in uh, Uruguay, am I saying that wrong, that right? Uh, it doesn't exist. This is created as a sort of aspirational metro. The names are sort of made up and they're a bit tongue in cheek, but it's this idea of you're not a real cool city until you have your own metro, and they're feeling a bit uh, sad that they don't, so a designer came up with this wonderful uh, fake metro system. And who remembers this? Anyone have a GeoCities page back in the day? A few people. Uh, I want you to pay attention to this. GeoCities had this very strange URL tree, strange to us now, where they divided everything. You had your subject material when you went on there, and they said, okay, what's your website going to be about? Okay, it's going to be about celebrities. We'll put you in Hollywood Park, and you know, what's going to be about this particular celebrity? We'll put you on this drive. And as a result, the entire, this is a visualized structure of GeoCities, it's organized into these neighborhoods, and it's almost as if we weren't able to comprehend the idea of uh, a, an unmapped, an, un, an area where geographic, uh, spatial uh, you know, arrangements didn't make sense anymore. And so we aligned the, the cyberspace, the fake, you know, the, not the fake world, but the immaterial world around physical geographical structures, or templates, uh, because we couldn't 
you know, didn't get around the idea of not having that. So, but it closed. Incidentally, uh, that, that big jumble of private profiles afterwards, that came after they stopped doing this kind of system. And so it's almost like a slum has sprung up because they removed the planning laws and everyone just built wherever they wanted to. Uh, the domain of Melchizedek, a fake town, a fake, uh, fake country, I should say, uh, established claims to uh, have an island in the Marshall Islands, has fake money, issues fake stamps, and it uses, it's a scam, it was created, it was a fraud, uh, it's used to sort of lay claim to um, uh, banking scams and things like that. You say, oh, I'm from the bank of Melchizedek, giving all your money. Uh, but it doesn't have any physical space, and that interests me because this is the Order of Malta, which is another country, uh, has observer status with the UN, it issues its own passports, it has its own money, its currency, and its stamps. Uh, it even has its own uh, car license place, and even briefly its own air, uh, you know, not air force per se, but an air system. Uh, but it has no land. This is a country that doesn't actually exist physically anywhere. It's just it's a, a hangover 900-year-old uh, chivalric order. Um, but nonetheless, it exists as a kind of state without any physical infrastructure. And that interests me because this is Kiribati, and it sits about two meters above sea level and less every day. And so the president of Kiribati is having to evacuate the entire country. Soon the whole thing will be underwater. It will ha is a country which will have no physical infrastructure whatsoever, but it will exist in notions of citizenship, in bank accounts, in passports, in web domains. All of those will still exist but there will be no actual physical country to underlie them. And so will someone from Kiribati still be a citizen of Kiribati after the island has sunk? Or will they adopt a nationality somewhere else? Can you have a country that doesn't actually physically exist anywhere? Maybe, maybe not. And so finally, this idea of changing reality uh, to suit your maps. This is a wonderful technology um, called, oh, I forget the name of it. Uh, it's used for surveyors um, when they're digging big holes in the ground. And this little Jeep with the thing on the top scans the dig around and then projects onto it the plans for that dig so you can see how close you're getting to your original plan for where you know holes in the earth should be and what's wonderful this is a one-to-one -one map an idealized view so the map isn't reality it's the idealized view of what you want reality to look like and then you drape that over the world and you carve out bits of the world until it fits the map that you had in your mind to begin with uh, so I think that's a very powerful idea for a technology. And finally, back to the Karachanites. They built their big ruler on the beach. Does anyone want to guess whether the ruler went up or down? Who thinks the ruler began to sink into the earth uh, as, the, as the world tilted upwards against it? Put your hand up. Anyone? A couple of people. Well, we have some. Yeah. Who thinks the world went down and, and the ruler just ended up getting further and further away from the earth and they found out it was concave? Anyone? No one, we've got a lot of flat earthists here today. <laughs> Everyone thinks it went straight. It actually dug down into the earth. They proved, they proved that the world was actually inside out. Uh, and it's, a, it, it's true, but I mean, it's a bit of a, you know, what do you call pathological science. They believed it so much that they built a ruler that would, you know, make their fantasy reality. But that's an important idea because here is uh, the border of Russia. When Germany invaded uh, Poland, they drew up a secret agreement with Russia to, uh, concrete, you know, to, to make firm the border between Poland and Russia so that the Germans wouldn't, you know, overstep their mark, as it were. Invading one country, you don't want to invade two, not at the same time, uh, although they did. And so they, this is uh, in the Brest region, and this river going down from the, the, from the top left down to the bottom is the Bug River, which has always been the boundary between the two countries. And so when the Germans, you know, said, we're going to invade, where does, where does Poland end? Uh, the Russians said, well, it ends at the Bug River, that's, that's the border. But then they realized after they'd signed that agreement that this sort of star-shaped pattern in the middle, this is a citadel, a 19th century citadel, classic star shape. And as you can see, the Bug River runs straight through the citadel. And the Russians were thinking, well, maybe, you know, the Germans have already invaded one country, they're probably going to invade some more. Uh, we'd kind of like to have that citadel on our side because we don't want to lose a chunk of it. Uh, to the Germans, and they would, you know, it's the point of a citadel if the enemy's already inside. And so before the Germans could actually arrive, the surveyors could arrive to fix the boundary and to draw the map, Ger uh, Russian engineers rerouted the entire river uh, around the citadel. And you can still see uh, down to the bottom left that patch of water. That, if you follow that your eye, you can just about see the ghost of the river of where they changed it. They rerouted the river to go around the citadel. Uh, so that when the Germans arrived, they said, oh, well, that's a shame. We thought it went through the Citadel, but I guess it doesn't. Uh, this, is the, <laughs> this is the border. And yet, to this day, 
That is the border between Belarus and Poland. It exists following this ghost river. It doesn't follow the true path of the river. It follows the idealized path of the river that the Russians invented. Uh, so that is a true, uh, a true fake reality. And that's the end of my talk, so thank you very much.